Learning Objective 2-3, prepare journal entries for investments using the equity method. Now, the equity method is designed for the situation where the investor has significant influence. We don't, if they have significant influence, as I said before, we don't want them recording dividend income. So we have an alternative method that they can use where they record the investment at its cost. And then as the investee earns profits, we adjust the book value for those profits. Profits would increase book value. Our share of the profits would increase the book value. Any share of losses would decrease it. And when we receive dividends, that dividends decrease the book value. The reason why is because it's thought that the dividends are giving you a payout of your investment. So since they're giving you a payout of your investment, then the value of your investment is less. So the way this works is this is getting any situation where you have significant influence and that's going to include corporate joint ventures where you don't have control. Now you, it's possible in a joint venture that you do have control. I know it's called a joint venture, but oftentimes in a joint venture, one company really has control and one company doesn't. So the company that has control would need to consolidate the joint venture and the other company would have significant influence. And the exact definition, ASC 323-1030, is that you have the ability to exercise significant influence over operating and financial policies of that company. That's usually um, significant influence. Now, again, in the absence of evidence to the contrary, what could be evidence to the contrary? Evidence to the contrary could be a situation where this investor that we're talking about here is a non-controlling interest and they have, let's say, 30%, but there's a majority interest that has 60% and they control it and they do everything and you could do whatever you want at the shareholder meetings because you have to, you have a seat in the board, but you could jump on, you know, you could stand on your head in the board meeting and no one really cares. You could say, please, please, dividends. No one cares. No one pays any attention to you. You don't have significant influence. So the way this is going to work is that, again, when the investee has net income, that's going to be income on your P&L, and it's going to increase the book value of the investment. If the investee has a loss, then that's going to be a loss on your income statement, and it's going to decrease the book value of your investment. If the company, if the investment, if the investment pay, declares a dividend, then you're going to debit cash because you're receiving cash or receivable. And you're going to credit the book value of the investment because now the value of the investment has gone down. In essence, the dividend is construed as a payback, as a payoff of the investment, and therefore the investment is worth a little less. The way the debits and credits will work is that your investment account would increase for any income, decrease for any losses, and decrease for any dividends. So the value of the book value of the investment is constantly going to be changing. This is not fair value accounting, even though the value of the investing will go up and down based on different factors. And the pros here are, is that the value reflects some economic activity. It's going to be reported as a single line on your balance sheet and a single line on your income statement. Um, but it might not necessarily reflect fair value. The question comes up, can an equity method investment be impaired? And the answer is yes. So if the value of an equity investment goes down significantly, then you may need to record an impairment on that investment. And usually that would be reflected in losses, but it, it's possible that you could have an event that indicates that the value of the investment has dropped and therefore you would need to record um, an impairment in advance and write down the investment. So here's an example of the equity method and let's go through these journal entries. ABC purchases 20% of XYZ and that gives the company significant influence, let's assume. And again, it's assumed to be significant influence, but it's possible that it's not depending on the circumstances. Here we're gonna say significant influence. Students ask me on a test, are you going to say, on a test it'll be made clear to you or the factors would be made clear so you, you would be able to figure it out, of course. So you would debit investment in XYZ stock and credit cash, $100,000.
Now, when XYZ has income, let's say XYZ has $60,000 in income. What you would do is you would debit investment in XYZ company stock for their share of this investment. That would be 60,000 times 20% or $12,000 because that's their share of the income. And you would credit income from um, investor XYZ for $12,000. And then there's a $20,000 dividend. Now that's a total dividend. So the way that would work is we would debit cash for 20,000 again times 20% because we only own 20% of it and credit investment in XYZ company stock $4,000. So what does the T account look like? Initially we started off with $100,000 and we added 12,000 for income. We subtracted 4,000 worth of dividends so the ending book value of this investment would be $108,000. What happens if you make this, they made this purchase <coughs> on the first day of the year, but what would happen if you made the purchase in the middle of the year? You can't use the whole year's income then because the company didn't really earn that income while you held the investment. So let's say you made the investment on December 1st and year end is December 31st. What you could do is you take the last quarter income, that's November, October, November, December, divide it by three and estimate what December income would have been. And that is the percentage of income that you're allowed to record. Dividends are not prorated in that way. If you receive a dividend, then the entire thing is construed to be a dividend and you're going to credit the investment and debit cash for the full amount. What if you buy more shares? then the cost of the additional shares would simply be added to the investment account and any additional income would be prorated based on how many shares you held on different dates. If you sell shares, then you're going to credit the investment account, prorating them for the number of shares that you've sold. Um, you would record a gain or loss based on the number of shares that were sold and the amount of the proceed that were received. Um, it's possible if you sell shares that you lose significant influence and therefore it's possible that you would stop using the equity method and you would return to using fair value accounting. And um, again, that's something that's new. It used to be that once you have significant influence, you're pretty much stuck with it. And um, the FASB has changed that. So under an equity method, investees dividends declared would be A, eliminated in consolidation, B, be the investor's income from investment, C, decrease the investor's investment account, D, increase the investor's investment account. Answer is C, decrease the investor's investment account because the journal entry is to debit cash or dividends receivable and credit the investment account for your share of the dividends. Under the equity method, investees losses would A, never reduce the investor's income, B, normally reduce the investor's income. C, always reduce the investor's income. D, always be eliminated in consolidation. The answer is B, normally reduce the investor's income. Um, I'm not sure why it wouldn't always. I think the reason why is because if the losses were below, brought it below zero, you can't reduce the book value of the investment below zero. And that's why it's not always. Um, but that's a pre-obscure situation.